were so enthused about having work and so on and so forth that it was an extraordinarily optimistic time. And so often the 40s are seen as this sort of golden age in Detroit history. Um, and I've been doing, I've been working on a book uh, on Detroit during World War II. Um, and the more research I've done, the more I've discovered that, um, in, in fact, the people who lived through World War II um, might think of it as a golden age now, but they did not think of it as a golden age necessarily um, when they were living through it. And one of the things that stands out the most starkly uh, in that wartime experience uh, is the Detroit riot of 1943. Uh, which was up until that, up until actually the 1960s, was the most violent civil disturbance in American history. It was of all the rioting that occurred during World War II. It was head and shoulders worse than every place else. So our riots were worse than the ones in Harlem, worse than the ones in Los Angeles. Um, so in fact, there was a great deal of turmoil in Detroit during the war. Um, and I would like to talk about that today and why it happened the way that it did. Um, and it has a lot to do with the history of Detroit since the 1920s. Um, Detroit was, in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, one of the most segregated cities in the United States. Uh, the, there were very few parts of the city where African Americans could live. For the most part, they were forbidden to live outside of some of the oldest parts of the city uh, through a, a phenomenon called a housing covenant, which is actually a private uh, negotiation between builders and real estate agents. And so uh, some of you may, if you, have, if you live in an older house, you actually might see this on an older uh, title that written into the title of the property when it's first uh, developed is uh, a stipulation that only certain people in perpetuity may buy this. And in Detroit, the most common uh, cause for not being allowed was to not be Caucasian. Uh, the second was Jewish. Uh, but there are also a number of other ones that, depending on what part of the city you're looking at, uh, might be relatively important. Um, through the 1920s and through the 1930s, African Americans attempted to break through this color line, but had been profoundly unsuccessful. Uh, probably the most famous of these cases is the Ocean Sweet case. He was a physician who had moved to Detroit. Uh, he was married, wanted to live in a nice neighborhood because his wife was pregnant. And he wanted to have a nice yard for his little what would be a daughter to play in. Uh, and so he moved to uh, a neighborhood uh, uh, up in the kind of northeastern corner uh, of the city uh, and was driven out uh, and ultimately was accused of murder uh, when, a, when a mob attempted to burn his house down and he attempted to defend his home. Um, the Ocean Suite case in many, in many respects did sort of set the tone of this kind of you know, solidification of the color line in the city, but in fact there were other attempts in the 1930s to break it, which met with similar lack of success. Uh, this idea of separate but equal uh, was actually established by the city itself in the 1930s. Uh, in the 1930s the federal government passed uh, a law that would provide money to assist cities in building public housing projects. And so Detroit was one of the first places to apply for this money, uh, and they received permission to build, uh, and support to build uh, two different projects. Uh, one down here, which was the Brewster projects, and one up here, which was the Parkside projects. Uh, they were identical. They were they're made with using the same building plans, so the apartments are all identical. The criteria, Oh, you want me to move Wendy? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the criteria for moving into them, you have to have a job. So you have to have some sort of external means of support to be able to live in these communities. Uh, however, your income has to be beneath a certain threshold. So you're working poor. 
Uh, so these are both housing developments that are aimed at a very specific demographic. Uh, that the idea was that they would provide decent, healthy uh, housing for people so that they could kind of economically get their feet under them. And as the depression began to lift, the idea was that eventually they would move out of these public housing projects and then other families would come in and replace them. So the idea was that this was sort of a step up in a kind of class ladder. Uh, as I said, these were identical except for one primary difference. Uh, if you were a working family that was white, you would live here. If you were a working African American family, you would live here. Uh, it was established by the Detroit Housing Commission. This, this would be very rigidly segregated housing. Um, and, and I want to point out a couple things about this. Uh, the, the city decided to select this as the African American housing project. Uh, this kind of checkerboard area is the highest concentration of African Americans in the city. Uh, these were, uh, there's about kind of parts of several wards, and it's basically the odd numbered ones one, three, five, and seven uh, below Hamtramck. Those areas. Uh, there, were all, there were virtually no housing covenants, which meant that African American families could move in and there would not be any kind of impediment. Also, this tends to be much older housing. A lot of it dates back to the late 19th century, some of it even the mid 19th century. So it was regarded as low quality. And so it had always been a neighborhood that had been for poor people. And usually people are new to the city. So if you look at you know what was the population like in the 1890s, it's largely Eastern European, Polish, Lithuanian, Russian Jews, those kinds of folks. And then as African Americans begin moving into the city in large numbers, they're sort of you know doing what immigrant families had done historically. This is where rents are cheap, this is where nobody really cares who I am, I can move in here. And the problem is that these other ethnic groups were then able in the 1920s and 1930s to move out into other portions of the city, whereas the African Americans were being held into these neighborhoods. And so as we get from the 20s to the 30s to the 40s to the 50s, the population density in these areas becomes increasingly African American. So the seventh ward is uh, over 70% African American by 1940. Uh, and we, we see sort of similar statistics in all of these places. And so uh, certain blocks have become completely African American by the time we get to World War II. Um, that on the other hand, Parkside was built uh, next to Chandler Park. Uh, it's in an area that was relatively uninhabited. Uh, it had been platted for development in the 1920s, but then the Great Depression happened. And so it was an area that had had very little development, but it was uh, very close to an industrial zone here, uh, and also next to that, you know, very nice public park. Uh, in both cases, the housing themselves, within the housing community, there were play areas for children. But one of the things that is a conspicuous difference between these two neighborhoods is the, is the idea of public park space nearby. Uh, this neighborhood, there's, there's plenty of ball fields, swimming pools, et cetera, et cetera. Down here in the center of the city, there's, there are parks, but they're very small. They're not as elaborate. They're not considered to be as, as beautiful as Chandler Park was. And so what we have here is the city government actually embracing this idea of segregation. That this is appropriate, this is what the people of Detroit want, this is how you maintain peaceful order, and at the same time you make sure that poor working families have reasonable housing. And, and I will point out, um, the photographs of this housing indicate that in fact it's very high quality. I mean the homes of the apartments, these are garden apartments, they're very nice, they're well appointed, they have modern kitchen appliances and beautiful bathrooms. And they're small, but they're very nice apartments. Uh, but nonetheless, what we do see is a very distinct difference between the two sets. 
that we also see this idea of solidification of racial neighborhoods in Detroit in other ways uh, in the late 1930s. Uh, the FHA, uh, the Federal Housing Authority, uh, has a specific policy that there are seven criteria that if you, if you meet them, uh, if you meet any of them, I should say, uh, your house will not be eligible for uh, FHA funding. And one of the criteria is neighborhoods. And one of the measurements of neighborhoods is how many African Americans actually call color and how many immigrants live in the neighborhood. If you have either large numbers of immigrants living in the neighborhood or large numbers of African Americans, the FHA will not fund housing purchase in that neighborhood for anyone. And so as a result, what we see is an enormous resistance to the idea of African Americans moving mm -hmm. into newly created you know, uh, neighborhoods, but also into pre-existing neighborhoods that are dominantly white. Now, this begins coming to a head uh, at the beginning of the war, actually before we enter the war, but after the war has started, uh, that as war industries begin taking off in really as early as 1939, but certainly in 1940, uh, there is, there's more money in the city, more people want to buy homes, and so there is actually a, a housing, a huge housing boom that occurs beginning in 1940 and then continuing uh, until late 41. And uh, one of the areas, and actually uh, I can show you here, uh, one of the areas that was being very significantly developed is up in here. Uh, this property up there was all planted, so it had all been subdivided and so on and so forth. It was all appeared on the city maps, uh, but once again, the Great Depression really had prevented the real development of this. But it was seen as a, a really an ideal neighborhood for people. And uh, it had always been marketed as a kind of upper middle class kind of place to live. Uh, there are developers that want to create uh, blocks of housing up in here. Uh, but the problem that they find with the FHA, because they want FHA funding, the problem they have with the FHA is right here is a very tiny African American neighborhood. And uh, there's about 35 to 50 families live there. Uh, once again, it wasn't, there was no housing covenant to prevent them from living there. Uh, they are for the most part poor people. They are for the most part also working poor. Most of the folks who, who live there uh, are supported by people who work at the Highland Park Ford plant. Um, but that creates a problem for the FHA and for the, the construction companies uh, because the FHA indicates that it will not provide economic support for builders who want to develop this area. Um, and so one of the big uh, compromises that occurs, which is actually suggested by the federal government, uh, is that a wall be built between this African-American neighborhood and the areas about to be developed. There we go. There we go. Um, that the solution was to build a half mile long concrete wall uh, that runs from eight miles south to almost outer drive. Um, it, uh, the idea is that by building this concrete wall, you will keep the blacks on one side of the wall and so the white neighbors won't have to worry about black children and black adults sort of randomly coming through their property. Uh, so the wall is built by the construction companies that are involved in this development. Did they make the black people pay for it? No. They pay for it. They do pay for it. It's an interesting question, and I like that. It's a Francis Jackson kind of question. Yeah, yeah. Because we're waiting on Mexico to pay for the wall. I was wondering if they made my folks pay for the wall. Yeah, no, they did not. Oh, okay. That might be an indication about what okay. happened. However, they did make them stay on their own side of the wall. As you can see, this is a photograph that was taken shortly after the completion, and some lovely African American children helped in the presentation of it. Um, that also I will point out this picture in the upper corner. This is the wall still exists. You can actually go see it if you want. Where is it at? The street. It's um, at Pembroke. It's actually um, 
Pembroke and Outer Drive. Pen, pen, it's, it's at Pembroke and Outer Drive. If you go, it's Alt, Altgeld, Altweld Park, which is between Pembroke, uh, it's at the corner of Pembroke and um, Outer Drive. There's a park there. Mm -hmm. And that's the best way to see it. That's actually, it, this photo is taken from the park. Um, and so what happened in, I think it was 2006, a neighborhood group said, this wall is horrible and we have to reinvent it. And so they got artists from the neighborhood and all the little kids to paint the mural on it. So it's very cool looking now. Uh, so it does still exist, though it doesn't divide the neighborhood anymore. Um, that as a result of the construction of this wall, the housing was completed, it was eligible for FHA funding, which then meant that the neighborhood was developed according to everyone's desires, at least everyone who was white and a member of the building and real estate community. Um, so what we have here is a situation where before the war begins, there is an incredibly deeply ingrained sense of racial segregation in terms of housing that then affects almost everything else, uh, most notably who goes to what school, uh, but also how you get to work, how easy it is to get to work. If all your housing is in one place, we go back to this map. If all your housing, if you're African American, or virtually all your housing is down in this neighborhood, and most of the increasing jobs are out here, or up here, or up here, then you suddenly have a fundamental problem in terms of being able to get to work. Unlike places like Southwest, which is really dominated at this point by uh, Eastern European families, uh, that their commute to jobs at the Rouge are much easier than commutes for African American families from the South. So yes, ma'am. What's, uh, what's the difference between slums and housing projects? What's a slum is always presumed as a um, poor neighborhood. Housing projects are also always in poor neighborhoods. Slums are considered to be um, derelict housing, housing of poor quality. Also, slums are a term that are almost always used, at least in this context, in the 1930s and 40s, as privately controlled, whereas uh, housing projects are almost always publicly controlled. Um, but in fact, you know, I, and I have to say, you know, there's 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 a lot of you know kind of nostalgia about Black Bottom and how wonderful it is. Uh, I've seen photographs of the houses they tore tore down to build Brewster. They were really horrible houses, and they were built in the 19th century, which means that they had no they 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 had electricity. But it was always after the effect, you know, that they didn't necessarily have running water. They didn't. They never had central heat. Uh, they were overcrowded, and so uh, the slums are that kind of situation under the control of private enterprise. In the case of Detroit, that's certainly the case. Um, and then the idea is these public housing projects are for the same demographic, more or less but we're going to give them a decent place to live so that they have some kind of aspirational hope to believe in the American dream and that kind of stuff. That as we start seeing this economic development at the end of the 1930s and the beginning of the 1940s, uh, most of the new jobs that are being created in the city are being created out on the periphery, uh, most notably here in Dearborn, but also up here in this part of Macomb County, right just across the eight mile border. Uh, the reason for this is that the property is really, really cheap. You can buy hundreds and hundreds of acres and, and, and you know, in these large parcels for very low prices. Uh, this was an area that had mostly been farms uh, and, and strange, I, I still can't help, help but remark on this. Root of, uh, excuse me, rhubarb farms were very big in this area. And so it's relatively easy if you want to build a factory to, to purchase a, a defunct rhubarb farm and, you know, start developing it because you really don't have to do very much work. You don't have to tear down any structures and so on and so forth. 
So this is very attractive for folks who want to, for companies that want to build factories up in this area, uh, but it's away from where you have a lot of folks who would like to earn more money and get a steady job. Also for African Americans, uh, this is, as I mentioned, it's significantly away from the centers of the African American population. So to get, although they can get jobs at the Rouge plant and then later at the Ypsilanti bomber plant, uh, there are <coughs> logistical issues of getting to work in the morning. So this is where we are before the war begins, on the eve of Pearl Harbor. Once we enter the war, what we see is an enormous effort, first of all, to prepare for the war, but as that affects Detroit in particular, we see this incredible effort to expand factory development. And so factories that had been considered in 1941 are being put on a much faster track. Other factories are being conceived uh, after uh, Pearl Harbor, and so 1942 is a boom year in terms of factory construction, factory expansion, and uh, the sort of, you know, putting plants online to produce weapons and so on and so forth. Um, that this means that the problem of housing for people who work in those factories becomes more and more difficult. Uh, there is a huge influx of population into the city. Uh, from other parts of Michigan primarily, uh, but really by the time we get to 1944, it's actually from all over the country, uh, but uh, thousands of families, tens of thousands of families really coming into the city in 1941 and 1942, also looking for places to live. So if you understand that there are already not enough houses that are nice, that people would want to live in for the people who already live here, and then you start adding tens of thousands of families. That's what the situation is. So the Detroit Housing Authority once again approaches the federal government and says, we need more housing. We need to construct housing. We want to give priority to people who have defense jobs. So one of the criteria for being able to move into these will be that somebody in the household has to have a defense industry job. Uh, and, but like the public housing of the, the 1930s, there's going to be a maximum income criteria. So if you earn more than a certain amount, you're not eligible for these. But the idea is that this is going to be the entry-level workers are going to work here. And so these are the new plant, the new housing structures that are going to be built. Um, the gold ones are whites only. The red ones are African American. Whites only housing is more attractive to the city in large part because the city does have a dominantly white population. And so they're arguing this demographically that, and most, the majority of the people also coming in are also white. And so they're talking about this need for white housing. Uh, this housing is all going to be built on the periphery of the city, near where the jobs are. There's a huge industrial development out here on the western side of the city. And so here we're going to have Herman Gardens. This will be uh, 21,000 housing units out there. It's the largest housing structure that Detroit has even attempted to build. Uh, Rooster and Parkside will both 700 houses, 700 apartments. Uh, Herman Gardens is going to be three times that size. So it's a very ambitious project. It's designed to put people, to put workers near jobs in Dearborn, but also uh, we're starting to see more and more factories being built, basically feeding into the kind of huge complex down there. Uh, so other com companies are also building plants out in that area. Uh, that also we see the development of two expansions. There's going to be a significant expansion here at Parkside. Uh, they're going to add uh, it's in two phases, but about 500 apartments here. And then they're going to build another complex here of about 700. And so the idea is they're going to provide this housing. These, these areas are selected because they're seen as relatively close to where the new factories are being built. But also they're in parts of the city where it has mostly been farmland. 
and so the land can be acquired at a relatively low cost. The African American community by this point is arguing that there needs to be places for African Americans as well. And so African Americans uh, under federal guidelines are all allowed to work in the defense industries. Uh, there is a, a kind of racial equality mandate coming out of the White House at this point. Uh, and so the argument is that you also have to provide African American housing for these workers. And so the U.S. Housing Authority, Washington, D.C., will insist that the other place that was going to be, this was originally slated for whites, would have to be for African Americans. This is in a neighborhood that is not fully developed, though there are probably, if you're looking at the enumeration districts, the, the census districts around uh, the housing, there are probably 2,000 to 3,000 families living in this area. They are all white. They are mostly Eastern European. This is an area that, because it is so dominated by Eastern Europeans, uh, is an area that is right in that liminal space between being called redlined, in other words, the FHA absolutely refuses under any circumstances to provide money, to yellow line, which is under certain criteria we might think about. This is an area that is currently, in 1941, redlined. But it's because of the combination of large numbers of immigrants living there and, and an important thing, the low quality of some of the housing because it's, it's, it's a poor working class neighborhood. The expectation of people in the neighborhood is that we will improve the neighborhood and then we will jump that criteria. And in fact, also what's happening is with immigrant families, Although there's lots of Polish and Lithuanian Americans living there, it's now grandpa is the one that immigrated. So the number of immigrant headed households is actually diminishing just because people are getting older. And so there's this sensibility in that neighborhood that this will eventually become a yellow line and hopefully even a green line neighborhood where we can all become rich off of our property values. This is the uh, housing development that the USHA wants to make African American, which will suddenly and permanently put it in a red line category. The USHA wants to put it there in large part because this is one of the cheapest properties it can secure in the city of Detroit. It's also within fairly good commuting distance to the plants at Highland Park and also to the plants that are being built on the, on the other side of the Macomb County line. That what we see beginning in 1941 and then continuing into 1942 is an enormous debate about this housing complex. Uh, that the congressman who represents this district, uh, Rudolf Tenerowitz, um, is putting an enormous amount of congressional pressure on the USHA to have this become a whites-only housing project. Both buildings? No, just the, 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 this one. which is so. This is Sojourner Truth. This is the Charles Street houses. Uh, this is Sojourner Truth. This one, to, to narrow it, wants to make this a gold star. The USHA wants to have it be a red star. Tenerowitz gets a resolution through the House of Representatives forcing the USHA to change it over to whites only housing. That with this, we see the creation of the Seven Mile and Fenland Association, which is an association of white neighbors in that region who are dedicated to the idea of preventing any African Americans from living anywhere in this vicinity that bowing to the pressure from the Seven Mile Fenland Association, the Detroit Housing Commission will attempt to reverse the position of the USHA by declaring it a white-only housing project. Mayor Jeffries, to make matters profoundly complicated, 
will, on the same day, announce that it's going to be a black housing project. So we have the USHA and the Detroit Housing Association on opposite sides in this debate, and uh, the uh, Congress of the United States and the city of Detroit on opposite sides, and no one's matching up. This means that we will see increasing political pressure on every point in the political process, from both the white community and the black community, to make this happen in the right way. But the right way has everything to do with who is making the argument. Um, the plan was to open this project in February of 1942. And so as we get closer and closer to the completion date of construction, um, the, 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 the rigor of demonstrations begins to increase. Uh, this is a sign that uh, I think is, has become fairly famous. Uh, it was put in a vacant lot across from the Sojourner Truth Homes uh, that was put up by the Seven Mile and Fenland Association. Uh, I want to point out the American flags on either corner uh, that they are. The Seven Mile Fenland Association sees itself as being the voice of patriotism, and they are arguing that this is how uh, we're going to have justice in America, and the protection of private property in America, and that this is how we're going to uh, increase, actually, uh, productivity in the plants. However, uh, what we will see uh, in that period of January and February is a solidification of government agencies coming down on the side that this will be an African-American housing project. And so the Detroit Housing Authority backs off, as does Congress. And so what we see is this prevalence kind of gelling in uh, January and February, excuse me, of 1942, that this will be, despite the signs and despite all the political agitation, this will be a black housing complex. Uh, the move-in day was scheduled for February the 28th. 25 African-American families were, were scheduled to move in. Uh, the idea was that these all had to be exemplary workers, so these are all people who have jobs in defense plants. These are all people who are sort of respected as very good workers, and the idea is we're going to sell this as kind of a patriotic move-in. Uh, however, there's a recognition that there might be problems, and so the city of Detroit sends 150 police to make sure that this will happen smoothly. Uh, those 150 police will attempt to regulate the 1,200 white protesters who have surrounded the complex and have declared that they will die to the last man to prevent any African American family from moving in. What we see is mayhem as a result of this. Uh, remember that, I mean, on both sides of this this dispute, we're talking about people who are primarily shop workers. And for those of you who know people who work in factories, all factory people have boxes of tools. And so um, what we see is, you can, it's, it's harder in this, in this photo, um, people carrying hammers, monkey wrenches, stuff like that, um, basically asserting that, no, my family's going to move in here, I've paid my first month's rent, I meet all the qualifications, go away. And the other guy's saying, no. And they also, because they also have these things in their hands. Um, that uh, more than 30 people will be injured on February the 28th. 108 will be arrested. Of those arrested, only three were white. Uh, the primary focus of the police force, which is, uh, the policemen who are all deployed to this are all white, uh, and their primary focus will be to constrain the sort of violent response to these protests. Uh, as a result, the February 28th move-in will actually be canceled and deferred into the future after further political consideration. After further political consideration, it will be decided on April 29th there will be a second attempt to begin 
putting people into Sojourner Truth. Um, however, only eight families, not 25, will be scheduled for move-in day number one, feeling that we can, we can defend eight families more easily than we can defend and control 25 families. In addition, uh, the city of Detroit will work with the state and the federal government, and Sojourner's Truth will be protected by uh, 1,000 Army troops and 1,400 state troopers, deciding that the city police really cannot be held responsible, that their reputation has been tainted in the first move-in uh, as being too supportive of the protesters, uh, and certainly inadequate to making sure, because it's all debacle that you, you, you know. Uh, by this show of extraordinary military force, they are able to move the first eight families in. You will note that every single move-in has armed guards around, uh, that troops are marching up and down the street, basically as a kind of show of force. Uh, they will stay there for several days as the other families slowly are moving in. Um, and there are also photos, I, I don't have them in this presentation, but there are photos of Sojourner Truth in the months after this where guys will go to work and they come home from their shift and they will sit out on their front porches with shotguns in their laps. And so there is a continuing assumption of potential for violence, although in fact, uh, as it turns out, the, the, the worst of this is actually, was actually the first move-in day. Uh, there are no kind of, you know, uh, coordinated efforts to, to force people out once they're in. And so what we see uh, in the early months of the war uh, for the United States participation in Detroit is already sort of catastrophic problems evolving in terms of race. Uh, I will also, if you want to go, you know, go back. Um, this is the last time that an African American housing project is going to be built outside of a black neighborhood for another 25 years. That's the lesson, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, how the Detroit Housing so, uh, Housing Agency sort of looks at this. Their lesson out of this whole thing is, you only put black people where black people. And so there are other housing projects that are built. Uh, Brewster is actually expanded during the war, and then the Frederick Douglass houses will be built after the war. But they're very careful not to break what are already established race lines in the city. There will be other tensions over race in the city in 1942. Um, Teachers at Northwestern High School, which is a dominantly white school, but does have a handful of African Americans attending. Um, there, this is not school-wide requirements, but it is uh, several teachers decide that all of the African American students have to sit in the back row of their classrooms, and the white students sit in front. So when you get your seating chart as a student coming in the first day of class, all the white kids are in front and the black kids are in the back. Uh, this rankles the parents of the African American children um, and a lot of other civil rights leaders in the city, but the principal defends this decision uh, and it continues. Uh, we also, throughout 1942, see issues over jobs and promotions. Uh, particularly, Chrysler and Packard are the two places where we see the most violent uprisings uh, that center around cases where an African American has been promoted to a job that African Americans had not previously held. This is particularly problematic at Chrysler where three African Americans are promoted to foreman positions where they will then be supervising white workers. This uh, actually sparks one of the largest wildcat strikes uh, of World War II. That we also see increasing tensions over zoot suits. Um, zoot suits are, are considered very cool clothing um, particularly in, in Detroit, particularly in the African American community, uh, although generally speaking it's considered really cool clothing for any poor kid, uh, young man, I should say. Um, and under the fundamental rules of clothing manufacture during World War II, they are not legal. It's not legal to manufacture a zoot suit once they start putting in the cloth rules because zoot suits use up an enormous amount of fabric. 
And so there are all kinds of rules to the garment industry about you can't put pleats in pants, you can't have jackets that go below your hip, you can't have lapels more than I think it's two inches wide. So all these kinds of construction rules for the garment industry. Um, and it's easy to regulate a factory to tell them not to make suit suits, but there's no prohibition against wearing them if you already own one because that would be unwise to throw away a perfectly good set of clothing. And so African Americans do wear suit suits that they bought legally before we start seeing the fabric criteria put in. Uh, also, we see a lot of manufacturer suit suits sort of beneath the law because this is, after all, a society where almost every girl knows how to use a sewing machine. And so girlfriends make them for their boyfriends, and sisters make them for their brothers, and so on and so forth. So zoot suits remain to be uh, a very common form of clothing, particularly for partying, for going out to dances, all that kind of stuff. And so African-American young men on Friday and Saturday nights, any night that young men go out looking to find girls, um, are wearing zoot suits, which are seen by people to be a fundamental affront to the war effort. That this is a sort of symbolic finger to everybody about saving fabric for the war effort. Uh, that uh, we see other kinds of conflicts. Uh, in June of 1943, uh, there's a private amusement park called the Eastwood uh, Park. Uh, it's up in that area between, uh, right at the top of Detroit, right before you get to Gross Point. Um, Eastwood was a whites-only park. And um, it had always been that way. Uh, however, um, in, as we're getting into those early war years, we do see more and more disposable income and also more and more of the sensibility of I'm an American, I'm defending democracy, and I have the right to go and ride a roller coaster wherever I have the money to go ride a roller coaster. Or take my girl out and show her what a good shot I am, and, you know, at the little penny arcade games, and that sort of thing. And so we see in June of 1943, a group of 50 black teenagers decide that they are going to break the color line at Eastwood. And so they enter the park. They are almost immediately attacked by 200 white high school students who are also recreating at the park. Um, and so a uh, riot ensues, as they say. Uh, this is broken up, uh, but it's the, the sort of, you know, the way that the two sides walk away from this is, is very different. And finally, what I want to point out to you in this period in 1942-1943 is the police department has many problems, but one that is often overlooked at this time is the police department is short 280 officers of what had been its official deployment in 1940. In 1940, as the draft begins and as people are being encouraged to enlist and so on and so forth, one of the kind of demographics that likes to join the police force likes to join the military. And so you have a number of police officers either being drafted or volunteering into the military. This escalates as we get into um, the war itself. Despite the fact, and this, this actually I find fascinating, and I still don't understand why, um, that the police force, the, the city of Detroit, the Mayor Jeffries, the Commissioner of Police, do not ask for more money to hire either the replacements for these 280 police officers, or in fact, it's a bigger city now. It's a more complicated city. They should be hiring an additional 280 policemen. And in fact, they're saying, no, 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 it's fine. We don't really need anybody. Our guys can take care of the problem. And so we have a police force that is dramatically undermanned. So this is what leads us to why you all came here today, which is to hear about the 1943 riot. So most of this talk is actually not about the riot itself. Sorry, I lied. Uh, the riot begins, we go to another map. It's the same map, just different colors. On June 20th, 1943, which is a Sunday, it was a hot week which means that on your day off, if you had that day off, you really wanted to go do something that was cool and relaxing. And in these days before air conditioning, as we all know, 
one of the only places that you can go to is Belle Isle. Unlike places like Eastwood, Belle Isle is not segregated. Never has been, never would be. And so for, since the 1920s, African Americans see Belle Isle as the where you go on the weekend in the same way that white Detroiters see Belle Isle as where you go. And in well, fact... when it's really hot. When it's really hot. When it's really hot, but hot is hot, and we all need to go to Belle Isle and sleep at night. Yeah. And, you know, go wading into the Detroit River and splash each other and all those wonderful things that you do to get cool on a day where it's 90 degrees outside. We all have an object lesson to leave today. Mm -hmm. um, June 20th was one of those days. There actually were a fair number of low-level incidents on Middle Isle that day. Police records indicate that there were um, several um, fistfights, there were arguments over girls, there were accusations of people stealing each other's picnic baskets, uh, there were uh, you know, ball games that got really, really rough really, really quickly. Um, and uh, so it was not a terribly good day to begin with. Um, because it was hot, people stayed on the island, as Francis suggested, you know, some spending the night. But people were, didn't really begin leaving until about 7 o'clock that night, and people were still sort of flowing off the island at about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Uh, in this context, um, Charles uh, Lyons, who um, had actually been one of the 50 African Americans who had attempted to uh, desegregate Eastwood and Eastwood Park. Um, he's, he's, he's a man of interesting reputation. Uh, he's, 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 as my grandmother would, would say, a low life. Um, he never had a job that we know of. Um, you know, he's, he's, but he always was around and he was an agitator. Um, uh, Charles Lyons uh, went into the Forest Club. The Forest Club was the largest African American Entertainment Center in the city. I mean, they, it referred to itself as a nightclub, uh, but in fact, there was a bowling alley there, there was a skating rink there, uh, there was a dance floor there, there were two bars, and so Charlie Little uh, goes to this place and he sees a friend of his, Leon Tipton, who is working behind the bar, working behind one of the bars. He says something to, Char to uh, Leo Tipton. Um, what he says is not entirely clear. Uh, there are conflicting stories of it. Uh, but then Leo Tipton jumped up on the bar and announced to the crowd in general that a bunch of whites had just thrown a, a colored woman and her child into the Detroit River and they both drank. Saying that this is what Lyons had just told him. That immediately sparks a cataclysm. I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, that people go out of the bar, kind of shouting about all of the indignities that they have been suffering in some cases for their entire lives. Uh, but you know how horrible uh, conditions are in Detroit and how awful everything is. And almost immediately, what we see is the breaking out of looting in stores in the area. Um, that generally when we look at black criminal behavior during the 43 riots, it tends to be property damage. It tends to be property damage in the black neighborhood. It tends to be properties that were <coughs> owned by whites. It also tends to be properties that were sort of catching points of civil society uh, in 1943 um, because this is a highly rationed society that there are all these restrictions on how much meat you're allowed to consume there are restrictions on how much sugar you can consume there are restrictions on how many you're only, you're only allowed to buy one pair of shoes a year so imagine what it's like to have a six-year-old child and only be able to buy one pair of shoes a year for that child um, there's all of these restrictions that people have been sort of accepting as part of the war effort, but have also been kind of grading under. Uh, when we look at the focus of who gets looted, it tends to be the stores that carry clothing, shoes, food, butcher shops, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's clearly something visceral going on here. 
Shortly after the um, looting begins, uh, we also see increasing white efforts that are physical attempts to attack African Americans. Um, unlike the, the African American efforts during the riot, uh, which are almost all about property, um, the not exclusively, but it's like 90% of them, 95% are about property. Um, whites being involved in rioting in 1943 are about crimes on personhood and crimes on African Americans. Uh, gangs of whites begin going into black neighborhoods to pick people up. Gangs of whites then begin to uh, go up and down Woodward Avenue. Uh, most of the city's trolley lines link to the Woodward Avenue lines. And most, most of the trolley traffic in the city is either on Woodward or on Michigan. Uh, and so Woodward, which is the sort of dividing line between the white and African American neighborhoods downtown, uh, is seen as a kind of liminal area for attack. And so white gangs begin congregating on Woodward, pulling African Americans off of trolleys, beating them when they see cars being driven by African Americans, then they stop the car. As you can see here, they flip the car, set it on fire. Uh, that uh, enormously violent uh, attacks on African Americans trying to get to work and so on and so forth. Mayor Jeffries will call uh, on the governor to send 1,000 state troopers, recognizing that his police are not able to contain the problem. Uh, those state troopers, I would point out, will not show up until the 22nd. I mean, they're coming from all over the states. So you have to gather them up and get them down here. Uh, and so there's, there's, there's a real logistical problem with this. Eventually, I will say uh, that Governor Kelly will send uh, 2,000 total state troopers into Detroit uh, during the period of the riots, but they're not going to arrive until things are already well in hand. Uh, Governor Kelly also will recognize that state efforts are not going to be adequate in this context, and so he will go to Washington, not literally uh, by phone, uh, and request that federal troops be sent to Detroit to assist the state troopers in maintaining law and order. Uh, that uh, uh, 1,900 army troops will be sent to Detroit to maintain order. Uh, they will also arrive, uh, they will actually arrive sooner because uh, they're coming actually already organized. Uh, they begin arriving on the night of the 21st uh, and then our, our, the main body of this 1900 is, is here by the morning of the 22nd. Uh, over time, an additional 2,416 army troops will be sent to the city to maintain order after the riots are, are quelled. And so uh, what we see here is a situation of enormous violence that can only be controlled by significant use of military force. Um, I find it interesting in all of this uh, that this area in red, point in the wrong direction. Okay, there we go. The area in red is where most of the civil disturbance occurs. So this is basically in the African, the kind of bulk of the African American neighborhood. The African American neighborhood really begins about here and is down in this area. Uh, it's in that kind of peripheral area uh, in a white neighborhood. Uh, here's, here's Woodward uh, and then clear up to Highland Park. Also, it continues on Belle Isle, though in fact the real violence at Belle Isle is actually the, the 9th and 20th, the morning of the 21st it's pretty quickly dispelled after that. Interestingly to me, uh, where there isn't rioting, at any of the defense plants. In large part uh, because the security teams at the defense plants immediately make it very clear that they will not tolerate any kind of violence or bad language or anything like that. Uh, but also because the people at the plants are there to, you know, make a paycheck and get the war moving and that sort of thing. So those are actually sort of islands of peace, really, in all of this, even the plants that are contiguous to the areas of violence. Um, there's no violence at the Detroit Receiving Hospital. 
So they're interesting stories of, you know, as people are being injured in this, they're take, a lot of them are taken to Detroit receiving. And, you know, so you'll actually have, you know, black guys and white guys who are just in the same fight. And, but they're sitting there waiting very patiently as people do in the emergency room for the nurse to come and stitch you up. And, and so it's like the fighting goes right up here, like up until the, the steps of the hospital and then it stops. It's like, okay, it's, it's, it's kind of like when 10 year olds, you know, fight and they say, time out, okay, you know. And uh, so it's, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get more reports from doctors and nurses, uh, and, but the ones I have are really interesting. Um, there are also no fights at Wayne University. Which, when you think about where Wayne is, I mean, it's in the middle of the riot zone. There are riots all around the university, and there is no violence on the university campus. Despite the fact that, unlike today, where it actually looks like a discrete campus, in fact, at this time, Wayne really doesn't have very many campus buildings. It's mostly classes Old in, and Old Main is the only one, really, but its classes are in old houses that they've converted into classrooms, that there are privately owned houses interspersed in the campus, and so Wayne doesn't really look like it does today. It doesn't look like, oh, we're on the university campus, we can't fight anymore. It's like, no, it looks like everything else down there. Um, and yet, there is no fighting at Wayne University. That fascinates me. Uh, the impact of the riot is significant. Uh, 34 people were killed. Uh, that's 25 blacks and nine whites. Uh, Two million dollars in property damage, which two million dollars in 1943 dollars is a lot of dollars. What really concerns the federal government is one million man hours in defense industries were lost. Because remember the main way of getting to work is the trolleys on woodwork. And so people are terrified to get, if you're African American, you're terrified to get on. But the, the, with cars burning in the middle of Woodward and these gangs running around. Uh, but also white folks are terrified to leave their neighborhoods because there are all these stories about how black groups are pillaging and raping white women and all that kind of stuff. Nearly 2,000 will be arrested. I want to point out an interesting distinction. What's wrong? Um, that. Um, very quickly, if you're arresting 2,000 people in a fairly small area, you quickly run out of holding cells. And so the police department begins commandeering abandoned buildings. There aren't very many of them in downtown, but there are some. Begins commandeering uh, vacant buildings and using them as holding pens for African American prisoners. And so if you are black and you are arrested, that's what it looks like. And you'll be held until you're finally charged and arraigned and all that kind of stuff. Whites, on the other hand, are for the most part actually held in the precinct houses. That also what is remarkable about these two groups is, uh, yes, there are more African Americans who are arrested than there are whites. Uh, African Americans, for the most part, are adults. Whites are significantly under 18. Uh, in fact, uh, the police department statistic is 194 of those arrested are under the age of 17, which is where juvenile court either begins or ceases to kick in. Uh, that almost all of that 194 were white. That these young men uh, were uh, teenagers. Aldo Tranny, who is this guy? Uh, this is while they are being, while they are waiting to be taken to a holding cell uh, inside the precinct house. Uh, that Aldo Tranny, with one of his friends, was playing pool on Woodward in a pool hall. Uh, that they heard that there was commotion. One of their friends happened to wander by shortly thereafter, uh, who was driving his brother's car. Uh, the oldest of these is 17, so they are all under age. Um, that the uh, Aldo um, discovers that one of his friends um, has a gun, has a, a revolver, 
And so they decide that they will drive into the black neighborhoods uh, looking for, uh, to avenge whatever it is that they want to avenge. As he says uh, in, in his hearing, we didn't have anything to do. We were just bumming around. We didn't know him, uh, <coughs> Moses Kiska. He wasn't bothering us. He was actually crossing the street coming home from work. But other people were fighting and killing, and we felt like it too. And so they shot him with a revolver in the car. Um, Aldo Trini uh, was sentenced five and a half years for manslaughter uh, because of his age. This is one of the patterns that we see in the, in the arrests. African Americans are held until they actually go before a magistrate and are either released or then in prison. Uh, however, whites, because of their age, tend to be released to their parents. And unless they actually kill somebody, in which case they are actually held uh, until trial. Um, that what we see is a very marked difference in terms of the treatment that has, I think, as much to do with age of the perpetrators as it does to do with uh, the actual acts of, of attack. That with this uh, almost uh, actually wild riot is going on, we see a question about you know how did this happen? How can this ha you know Detroit is this wonderful place? We're in this golden era where everyone's happy, and everybody has a job, and the Great Depression is over. Um, one thing that does happen almost immediately from all quarters is there's a very quick dismissal of the idea that this is a conspiracy. There's a lot of language on Monday and Tuesday that this is really the Klan or the Nazis or the Japanese that have started this. And by halfway through Tuesday, city officials and national officials are all saying, no, this has nothing to do with conspiracy. There is no fifth column that is trying to overthrow our government by fomenting these riots. Uh, so that actually disappears from the rhetoric pretty quickly. However, as, as time goes on, we see there's a very clear division uh, that blacks and whites interpret why this happened and what happened in very different ways. Uh, the government at all levels, local, state, and police, uh, excuse me, and national, uh, will defend the actions of the police, arguing that they were simply overwhelmed, they were all acting in good faith, and they simply were outmatched by this chaos. Uh, that uh, Attorney General Francis Biddle will make a recommendation to Franklin Roosevelt that, uh, and, and the official sort of Washington position coming out of the Attorney General's office is that the reason that this occurred was because of the rapidly increasing population in defense centers. And what he recommends is that careful consideration be given to limiting, and in some instances, putting an end to Negro migrations into communities which cannot absorb them, either on account of their physical limitations or cultural background. And so from the federal level, what we're seeing is the way that, you know, this all happened because of all these people coming into the cities, all these outsiders that caused it, and so if we can just not have blacks come into cities, into defense centers, then everything will be fine again. That what we also see is an enormous pressure on African American civil rights movements. Uh, the NAACP was very active at this time in the city of Detroit. There were a number of African American newspapers. They had all been calling for equal rights. They had been very active during the Sojourner Truth Crisis and all these other minor crises that had occurred in the meantime. And uh, the argument, both at the federal and at the local level, is that had the civil rights movements not been inciting people to demand equality, that we wouldn't have had problems. That what you have to do is sort of accept your lot in life, and that, so there is actually an enormous amount of pressure that's put on the NAACP in particular after these riots. The federal government, however, will be primarily concerned about defense output. How can we make sure that we have enough weapons to fight the war? Uh, that uh, what we do see is uh, a very tight tightening up, and what you have here is that that's that continued U.S. military presence in the city, making sure that nothing else happens. 
So not only do we have tanks in the city, which are there for about eight weeks, um, and I met a woman who was, was very upset because she was supposed to be taken out to a special luncheon on the day, on Monday after the riots had started because she just graduated from the eighth grade, and so she was really broken because you know, her father wouldn't take her out to lunch, but it was okay because a month later he did take her to the kind of promise luncheon with all of her girlfriends, and they were at a restaurant where there was a tank parked right outside. So she saw this slide once and she said, I remember this. Um, that uh, also, as you can see, this, I don't know, actually, I don't know that you can see, but this gentleman here, this, this, this private, is sitting on boxes of hand grenades. So it's not merely that we are using tanks to defend the city of Detroit, but we are perfectly happy to throw hand grenades at civilians. And so this is, this is what basically keeps the peace. Yeah. Yeah. Was it true what Charles Lyons said? Oh, he just made that up. The general, what, what we don't know is, did Charles Lyons make it up, or did Leon Simpson make it up? But it, but, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. There were not a woman and a baby thrown into the Detroit River. No, right. yeah. So all total, that, that is total fabrication. Okay. So the whole thing started with a lie. Mm -hmm. And a lie that you really could have, you know, in other situations. If this happened today, if somebody walked into a bar tonight at midnight and said, bunch white folks just threw a black woman and her baby off the Detroit Bridge. Well, you know, somebody there would get on and, you know, not just Google and, you know, look at the newspaper and you would, you'd, you'd like chat. You'd think about this. But this is a society that just assumes, well, of course they do. And this is enough. This is, this is the line that we draw. And so it, it goes from zero to 60 in a period of about an hour and a half. <laughs> and one can look at this in the same way that as soon as the stories of looting, which actually are happening, start filtering into the white community, immediately carloads of high school students from the northwest portion of Detroit are driving down to Woodward to defend their neighborhoods from these marauding gangs of black people. And it's all almost instantaneous. I mean, it's as instantaneous, I think, as humans can behave. Um, all based on this stupid law. Just a stupid law. So that's really very, very different from what started the 67 riots. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would argue, though, a lot of the catalysts are very similar. That, you know, you already have, people are really angry yeah. before the riots. Yeah, I remember. And, you know, that when you have a society that has a lot of problems where people feel, there are large classes of people that feel there's injustice, and it doesn't really take much to trigger people to, to you know, if, if there hadn't been sort of, in 67, had there not been standing complaints about the police department, Sorry, first. If it hadn't been for stuff like that, would people have just sort of stood around and complained and whined and yelled and then watched as their friends got taken off? You know, probably. And so, in that sense, I think they're very similar. Um, what I will say is that you know, almost instantly, what we see is, you know, in terms of this response of kind of mashing it all down, it's not just force. It's also about this propaganda of, if you have riots like this, you're really helping the Nazis, you're really helping the Japanese. This is anti-American to riot. Uh, this is actually a cartoon from the UAW, uh, but similar ones are all over the place. This gets republished a lot of places. And um, you get, there's a radio program that CBS does talking about how this is really just about helping the Nazis and how it's really undermined, it's unpatriotic to engage in this kind of behavior. And so what you need to do is kind of figure out other ways to deal with this. Now were those geared towards the black community or everybody, the white community? Everybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, when you, because this is really, to me, it's very much against, you know, because the guy here Jim Crow. is, yeah. um, and, but there, this is something that also, you know, has a lot of resonance within the black community as well. Um, they feel differently in, in terms of their role in the kind of perpetration of this, but, um, but there is this sort of sense that, yes, there's this huge problem in the city, but we're not going to do that. So there's kind of a uh, uh, kind of tamping down of it that you don't see after 67. You know, that's why there's this whole debate about 67. You know, was it a riot or was it a rebellion? And I, I, I don't use the term rebellion consistently, but I see the argument for using it because things do permanently change. It takes about a decade, but things do change in Detroit. Nothing really changes after 43. The, the racial lines of segregation do not appreciably move. That black access to jobs in the best paying industries does not particularly improve. That you still don't have black city councilmen. Remember, Detroit's city government is all elected at large at this point. And so it means it's impossible for an African American get, to get elected to the, the common council. And that's why the Common Council elections are structured that way. So it's not so much because blacks can't do it, but so immigrants can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so it means that despite the fact that there's a lot of language about this was bad and we should have done it and it should have happened, still the language is about tamping it down, about holding it in place and not allowing this country to go. And not because it's right or wrong, but because it hurts the war effort. Exactly. We can't fight the Germans and then have military people patrolling cities trying to keep you guys from killing one another. Exactly. 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 So it's in this very kind of narrow, you know, like I, I showed you on the map before. After Sojourner Truth, there are no black housing projects built outside of established black neighborhoods. Not until the 1960s when they desegregate all the houses. That's what it takes. And that you still see the same kind of complaints about you know, issues of black student promotions at factories in the city. You still see all kinds of problems. Of, in, in 1948, the, the, the law changes about housing covenants, and so they become illegal, but in fact the real estate operators tend to continue to essentially enforce them outside the books. And so it, it continues to be extraordinarily difficult for African Americans with jobs, with good credit scores, and all that kind of stuff to be able to move outside the black bottom. So that's why I would never not call this a riot. <laughs> because it doesn't yield to any kind of lasting change in any significant way. Yes? Uh, I, <clears throat> I am from Detroit. I was there when I was a little kid. Uh, today I had coffee with a couple of friends of mine. Why do you want to come here and, and go over this Detroit riot hall? Why do you want to do that? Maybe I can learn something. I did learn something. Cool! <laughs> How cool is that? As an educator, that's my goal. <laughs> Number one, Eastwood Park. I didn't know that it was segregated. I really didn't know it. Mm -hmm. Now I know. And, and why would you? Because you know that kind of segregation in the North is so subtle. Yeah. If you looked African American, or if you had, if your best friend growing up was an African American kid, and you said, "Let's go to East Point," and he would say, "Yes, that sounds like fun," and they would stop you, and they would be very polite about it. But they, they would not want to let you in. What's, what's really different is here 50 kids, I mean teenagers, just say, yeah, right. <laughs> the other thing, I went to Cass Tech. I don't know if anybody went there. I recall, I don't remember colored kids there. If that's okay to say? No. <laughs> Black kids there? Yeah. But there weren't. Huh? There weren't any. There weren't any. I don't mean, yeah. <laughs> no. mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there were a very small number of high schools 
that had a very small number of African Americans. And then there was Miller. Miller High School was, yeah. if you were African American, you went to Miller. And, but schools that you had to apply to get into, like Cass Tech, it was kind of a quiet part of the application process. I mean, I, I have not seen the school records of Cass Tech, so I cannot say that no African American attended during the war, but I've seen lots and lots of photographs, interiors of Cass Tech during that period, and I have yet to see anybody who looks even remotely not white. Well, you know, a lot of the racism was subtle. Um, I know Dr. Miller because I retired from Oakland University. I was a nursing professor there for 30 years. And one of the things that probably no one else is really all that concerned about, but it's part of the whole conversation, there was no place in Detroit for a black person to become a registered nurse. None of the diploma programs, Harper, Ford, Grace, none of them accepted black students. So when, you, when I see the generation of nursing people above me, they all went to New York, to Harlem Hospital. They went to, um, uh, to Grady Hospital in St. Louis. The generation above me, in order to become a nurse, they had to leave the city of Detroit because there was no place up until the 60s. I'm not talking about, you know, 100 years ago. Up until the 60s, there was no place to go in the city if you were black and wanted to become a registered nurse, you had to go, you had to have a family that had the money to send you to Harlem, to Providence, to Grady, um, uh, in order for you to become a registered nurse. And so that kind of subtlety is not, no one, no one knows about that. No one, no one is saying, why well, isn't that horrible? It doesn't imprint on your consciousness. You know, so when I said I wanted to be a nurse, my family was horrified. You know, I come from a snotty black family where all the women are school teachers. And I wanted to you know, be a nurse, and they didn't consider that genteel. But I went to Wayne State University, and I did not understand until I went to clinical at Ford Hospital. And we had to change our uniforms in their diploma school dorm. And I'm looking at pictures of their graduates. And I'm going from pictures, actually happened, from picture to picture to picture to picture to picture. And it wasn't until 1967 that I saw someone who at least was a person of color. 1967, Ford High School School Nurse. Now maybe there was someone prior to that who was so light that on a black and white picture they weren't a parent, but there certainly were not great, great, great groups of African Americans who were accepted at these diploma programs. It just didn't happen. Yeah. And it's the same thing with police force that the police force, there are a few African Americans, none of them make sergeant until you get into the very late 50s, and they all patrol in black neighborhoods. And, you know, there are accounts of this, this riot where, you know, they are told by their captains that their role is to keep your people under control. And so it's not about providing any kind of equitable Justice. I've never seen this cartoon before. Can you break it down a little bit? I'm not getting all the symbolism. Okay. What are, are do you have factories in those other cities? Yes, these are these are the cities that have racial disturbances in 1943. They all pay in comparison to the one in Detroit. Uh, probably. Uh, Um, that um, Los Angeles is the zoot suit riots where a bunch of sailors start beating up on Mexicans. So it's not black and white, it's, it's, it's white and Mexican. Uh, but it comes back to that idea of Mexicans also like zoot suits. And so they just start going through the streets beating up anybody wearing a zoot suit. And like, you know, beating them unconscious and, you know, splitting their heads open. That's what I say beat it. Um, these are both uh, also relatively minor in the sense that um, they are, um, um, you know, it's a relatively small number. We're talking about hundreds of people being involved in the <coughs> accidents. 
and they don't last for very long, but they are sort of the kind of precursor to this. Uh, Mobile and Beaumont are both about African-American troops stationed in cities where there's rampant segregation. And so you see fights <coughs> between segregationist police officers, civilian police officers, and African-American army personnel who are on liberty and men in their business going to Mars and doing things that young men on liberty do. Uh, but because these are segregated cities, then they're attacked. And they're, in both cases, they are not supported by their commanding officers. I'll point out, you know, here in Michigan, there's actually a, also uh, an important, though very minor skirmish over self uh, the, uh, the, there, There's uh, Black Air, the Tuskegee Airmen, are stationed there very briefly. And there is one officer's club, and they're told they're not allowed to use it because it's white only. And so a fight ensues uh, over access to the officer's club. And, and, the, and the commander shot, uh, the, the white commander shot a black private. Yeah, he did. Killed so, him. He didn't kill him. He didn't kill him? He did not die. I thought he no, killed him. He went him. into a, a hospital there for some length of time, uh, mm -hmm. and a movie star came to visit him uh, trying mm -hmm. to smooth over something. Yeah. This is the monitor leader uh, that year. But it's very interesting. How, how on earth could an officer come out of an officer's club and just shoot point blank uh, a black officer? How could that be? And not officer, a private. Because he was assigned to drive him that night? Yes. And he didn't want that driver. Jeez. So it was, it was very interesting. It, it also but, um, spread into um, Mount Clemens, too, mm -hmm. because they would. Um, the Tuskegee Airmen wanted to go down and because Mount Clemens was a, was a was a hip place at the time. Yeah, it had a lot of jazz and, and, <laughs> and, and so if they couldn't go to the officers' club, they, they wanted to go to Mount Clemens and, and, and some of the some of the smoke. Mm -hmm. What is going on in this? Honestly, I, well, okay, well, there's are laying on the ground. Those are African Americans who have been beaten up. Oh, okay, and what's in his hip pocket? Is that supposed to be some old Southern guy? Yeah, what is that? it's an old Southern guy, Jim Crow. Uh, okay. And so it's wild whiskey in his hip pocket. And that club thing with the nail, is that a kind of thing that you... Whiskey and stupidity sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, there you go. It's just yeah. fancy. And he's pinning on a, a metal on this? Yeah, the Emperor, the Emperor is pinning a metal on him you know, for um, um, for the war. Yeah. Okay. No. Well, the German war. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the German metal. <laughs> I think this is a really good cartoon because um, one of the, the large component of World War II was we were fighting against two extremely racial regimes that were killing people because of their race. I mean, the, the, the Germans were hauling the Jews off and, and killing them, and, and the Japanese were actually be, were very anti-white to get rid of white colonialism, and then they in turn enslaved the same people that they, they took. Well, the Japanese so, hated everybody. Yeah. So, so we, so we are sending people off to war to fight these people. Our entire industrial and economic system is bent to do that. Yet, it really forced us to confront our racism at home. So, I, I you know, it, it, it also was the end of colonialism throughout the world too. That was the beginning of the end of it. So, you, you see this, this global change of racism. But yet, at home, we still had it. I mean, there were, there were cases in the United States where, where German um, prisoners of war were brought in and allowed to have a, a drink of milk at the, at the counter, but the black soldiers who guarded them had to be taken out back. And it just, we started taking a, a hard look at it. It didn't break racism in this country, but it surely cracked it, where by the 1960s we start seeing actual change with the Civil Rights Act, and, but problems continue to linger, which shows how hard it is. But this, but, but this says to people, we are our own, we are helping the enemy by not confronting our own problems within our society. And, and I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the glaring problems was there was a take it for grantism racism. I mean, for, for, for 60 days in high school, I had, a, I had an African American girlfriend. It ended real quickly when my mom found out. <laughs> okay. I, I'm not kidding. You have to think about my grandchildren. <laughs> and, 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 and it's not because my mom was evil, hated, or anything. It just 
It wasn't. It was. It was. This, this, this wasn't done. It was taken from you. No, you can't do that. What do you mean? I can't. You just can't do that. There was no explanation. That there, there, there was no nothing like that. And, and, and what's important for you to understand <laughs> is that the same thing happened in black living. Yes. <laughs> So, oh, I, I bet you her parents were saying the same thing yeah, to her. So why, when I was in Wayne State, a white guy asked me out, and I didn't know what to say. Right. But I knew one thing for sure. You ain't going home, right? I, you know, <laughs> I could not bring some young white guy into my parents' house and say, I'm dating him. My father might have shot, no, I'm not, not in this life I'm going to be. So, um, it, it, it's just... so that's the other thing, is that the, 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 the black family would, would have been simply equally, if not more so, as horrified as, or, or whatever the term is, you know, shock, surprise, mm -hmm. as, as your mother would be, because being in black, particularly in the 60s, where blackness was no longer ugly, you know, you gotta remember growing up, being black was a, a derisive word, even between black people. Me calling another black person black was an insult because black was not good. When I saw Dows on TV, we only saw white Dows. We didn't see black Dows. And so in the 60s, we were getting to the point where we were celebrating blackness. So it was even more horrible for a black person to date a white guy when we're all having this increased embrace of our race and our, our curly, you know, pinky hair and big lips. And then you're going to date somebody white after all we've been through? <laughs> Did you, did you yes. notice in the little the picture of the, the little the children from the wall that the little girl's holding a white baby a white baby doll? I saw that was male. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, that just struck me. They, as, they, as, you can find black dolls in the car. Yeah. Yes, sir. In World War II, in the state of Michigan, in all the states, there, there was no national guard. The national guard was absorbed by the army, so there were state forces. And when you make mentions of state troopers, they may be state troops, which were the home guard. And in Michigan, in Detroit, there was a battalion of what they called colored soldiers. There was two companies of military police in, stationed in Detroit, the Collingwood Army. Um, and I read a report after that and, and of things like, what can we do differently? And one of the, the black community had said that if they had deployed those two companies, that, that battalion of military police from the state troops, uh, which they didn't, they're, they probably could have squelched things fast because the black community would have listened to them and would have, have backed up. But they did not, the state did not deploy those two companies, that battalion of a black MP. So um, um, that's just my input there. Thank you. They, they, I, will, I will be making a road trip to Lansing to begin on that. Well, there's a book, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, should, I don't have it. I was going to bring it, but I loaned it to somebody. And it, it's a, like a yearbook after the, the state troops were disbanded, when the guard was reorganized, the state troops were disbanded. Um, and it's kind of like a yearbook of all the different units. And they have pictures of all those guys as of like 1946 of those two companies of military police. So, um, well, and I, I will say, even the regular army was far more accepted by the black community than the, the Detroit, because relations with the Detroit police had been so bad uh, before this, and, and in, large, in large part because of Sojourner Truth. Well, in that, uh, that same report, though, they said even the white state troops that were stationed at Paquette Armory, which was a factory on Paquette, right off of Woodward, it burned down a few years ago, but uh, they said that uh, those troops that were housed in there during that time were throwing objects out of the building at black people that were walking by. So they were their own, they were a problem they themselves. Were and that's why they were saying if you had brought the, the, the black troops in, uh, it would have been better. Yeah. They would have moved and probably would have listened to them and, and, and it would have diffused things a lot faster. Yeah, you didn't have that whole backstory crap over. Because, like you said, predominantly the black rioters, if you want to, were, were, were older. They weren't kids, where the, the whites, if you look at all the photos I've seen, they're just punks. They're just kids that were just waiting to get drafted. And that's all they were, going to school or not going to school, and just, just living. And that's another thing, it's hard to understand. It's, it, 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 I guess it's kind of a racist thing. It's, it's hard to picture the city of Detroit of being roaming bands of white kids. 
you know, teenagers that could cause problems. You know, because it, it, it wouldn't happen. To, there isn't anything like that today. But it's just, when you read that, it's like, what? You know. <laughs> well, part of it is, at, by this time, by 1943, all of the public high schools are on half days. Right. And so... And it's June, so it's almost the end of the school and, year. And so, you know, even but even during the year, right. you're you're either there in the morning or you're there in the afternoon. You're not there in the morning. Too many and so they're out roaming around all the time. I I did uh, a few weeks ago. I, I ran across a news story from Halloween in 1940, which I'm trying to figure out what it all means, but I will share it with you. And it was a story that. Um, a group of students from Gross Point High School um, were upset because 20 some of their friends had been out on Halloween night and as a prank had decided to trash the police car, the patrol cars of the Gross Point Police. And so they were breaking off antennas and doing things like that. So first of all, Gross Point High School students on Halloween going down to the police station and vandalizing the patrol cars. Okay, so that's piece number one. When the police arrest them for vandalizing the police cars, and the Gross Point police, is, their intention is they're going to hold them until their parents come and take them away and they're going to yell at their parents and what the parents do with them. Another group, a much larger group of hundreds of students from Gross Point, find out that their classmates are in jail and decide to physically liberate them. And so they go down and start throwing rocks at the police precinct. And they are only dispersed with tear gas. These are teenagers in Gross Point in 1940. Which Gross Point? I don't know the, the word of the... the, 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 the they only refer to Gross Point High School. Right, I don't know which, which police department. Oh, I see. Um, actually, I'm not absolutely sure. I don't recall because I wasn't refreshing my mind with this story. Okay, and what, what was the date? It was October. The story, I think, came out on November 1st of 1940. Were you at Crown Hill? <laughs> 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 If you read a lot of the old Detroit news and the Detroit Free Press, and you know, a lot of times in the 50s, you know, they, nowadays you kind of laugh about the, the uh, juvenile delinquent problem, and we always kind of fluff it off. But it was a big problem in the 40s. And, 50s. and, and if you read the newspapers of, in Detroit, the Free Press and the News, they, there's a lot of stuff in there. The kids were doing some nasty, bad things back then. My, my graduating you know, class was throwing bully balloons at, at the cops. Um, well, but we I'm, had a riot at lunch one day. But we're talking, like, like you said at the beginning, we have this preconceived notion of during the war in the 40s, everything was just so nice, and we were in the war effort and all that. And when you read the newspaper, it's, that's not so. It was up, up, this stuff, up, up, of course, but there was a lot of other nasty, bad things going on. I met a lot of older guys that were kids back then. They, they were not nice people <laughs> when they were kids. You know, and just, they, they tell these stories, and like, really? In the 40s? You no, know, in the 50s? You talk about learning, though. In 1967, I was in, I was in Germany. All of us white, white soldiers were locked down. My parents just, we had a black section, and then we had soldiers. We had a white section. We were all locked down in their respective quarters. <coughs> and for that, I came back in March of 1968. I was working at Smyrna Tool, and I, I don't know if this is 
for me, and you probably love them very tall a lot. I got in my car, turned, turned east on the climb up, and turned south down the crash. Immediately I got pulled over by the East Detroit Police Department. And he says, out of the car, you have a so the short haircut, spread eagle. What's with the gas can on the back? I'm going to cut the grass. So you're going down for the ride. This is one ride. I just, I can never ride it. So he says, he says, you've got a gas can. Are you going down there? You don't, don't get smart with me, kid. And I said, I says, officer, I said, I was working at, at Salerno Tool. I said, it's no degree 77. He said, I'm going away past this. If you ain't going to go, go back to Frazier and, and turn, on, turn on the radio. <laughs> well, I don't know what they, what they did, but they did at that time. The next morning, I don't, I, I don't know the exact dates, but the next morning, everything from Detroit all the way up to, to about 18 mile road, Roma Hall, the weddings could not have alcohol. And you remember, you couldn't get gas caps? So that, they did that for, I think, a week after when the riots first started. So at least they learned that much. They, should, they were. They were checking for anything you might have. And I think the curfew was, I didn't know what curfew was, I was like some working afternoon trip, but the, uh, I believe they have, the curfew was like 7 o'clock, I don't yeah. remember. Yeah, right. <coughs> Well. Thank you. Thank you. You've been wonderful.